the sample case three um, is a um, 44 year old woman. She's just presenting for a stock standard operation, elective cholecystectomy. She's got a past history of breast cancer. She's been cured. She was treated with surgery and chemo radiotherapy. She's in remission, but she's got chronic post mastectomy pain syndrome, PMPS. And that's been managed principally by her local doctor um, after advice from her practitioners on op with opioid escalation. Okay? And it's still now poorly managed pain. So she's probably been mismanaged for her chronic pain syndrome. And this is a fairly common occurrence. So what can we do about this? Yeah, look, we can use our typical sort of perioperative approach, throw in some gabapentinoids because they, they, you know, they may be useful, maybe look at some um, neuraxial options if it's going to convert to open, et cetera, et cetera. But probably what is more important here is that we recognise that this is a chronic pain state that may not be being managed appropriately, that we think about initiating some um, antineuropathic agents and that we communicate with someone who is actually going to take responsibility for managing this in a more effective way. That may not be ourselves because we may not have a prolonged engagement with this patient, but we need to be um, uh, mindful that these patients are around and look into enacting care pathways that are appropriate. Otherwise, this woman's just going to go back to the same situation and she's probably going to have further opioid escalation and suffer the consequences thereof. This leads us on to the issue of pain and cancer survivors. We've already said that 30% of people who are cured of their cancer or in remission will have ongoing pain. Again, of this, probably 5 to 10% have significant pain. That is pain that impacts on their day-to-day -day life, affects their function, affects their ability to work, affects their interpersonal relationship, affects their psychological state. Most of these patients, according to the literature, are disinclined to report their pain. Why? We don't know exactly, but we suspect it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, issues, including fear that this may represent recurrence of their tumour, and if they put it aside and ignore it and, and, and um, just try and get on with life, which may not be an inappropriate way to manage it, but may be an inappropriate way to psychologically uh, encompass it. Um, uh, the other is that they might be disinclined to say to their general practitioner or their surgeon who has cured them of their cancer that I'm left with this long-standing pain. All right? There are other issues as well. And uh, roughly speaking, we suspect about 10% of patients who have chronic pain in the cancer survivorship model are actually receiving appropriate care, not only from a pharmacological perspective, but from the multidisciplinary care perspective. Sample case four, um, uh, this time we're moving on to more advanced cancer. We've got a 68-year-old woman. She's got a large um, adenocarcinoma of the uterus. Uh, it's inoperable. It's now invading the lumbosacral plexus. Um, she's been managed principally by the palliative care physicians. She's had uh, escalation of her opioids and they've added in some antineuropathic agents, that being ketamine. However, now she's got a fluctuating level of consciousness. They don't necessarily want to admit it to the ICU, but they want some advice on how best to manage her because they can't control her pain. And now she's starting to um, uh, become, uh, uh, recurrently meets uh, medical emergency criteria. And if there hasn't been uh, advanced directive planning, um, that can be significantly problematic. Now, certainly I'm not um, suggesting that this patient be intubated and moved to ICU for care, um, but one of the um, things that we need to be aware of is that um, uh, pain during the end-of-life care is very common. It can be extremely difficult to treat. Um, often it's, a, it's, it's the cause for uh, initiating terminal sedation, uh, which is not necessarily a very pleasant way to go for patients and their families. Um, and one of the options that's often overlooked in this situation are interventional options. And so for this particular patient, uh, one of the um, uh, interventions that I would potentially offer would be intrathecal management for end-of-life care. And this would be quite simply placing a, an externalised catheter, just a robust uh, Portex catheter, um, and running a combination of local anaesthetic opioid and pro probably some clonidine to try and get some better control so that the um, medications causing the neurological side effects can be de-escalated so that she can wake up a little bit and spend some meaningful time with her family before she finally dies. Obviously, you also need to take into, a care, um, uh, take into account the fact that these patients need um, other comfort cares and uh, the, our palliative physicians are the best people to refer to for, for that. So rounding off, um, if we're going to look at the comprehensive care of um, pain management in the cancer model, we need to have a multidisciplinary approach. The um, members of the team here have not mentioned any particular orders, and it's not an exhaustive list. But yes, if we're looking in, in the um, uh, acute model, we need to have well-established and probably um, medically-led acute pain services. Uh, we need to have good relationships with our palliative care physicians, our pain physicians. The GPs need to be engaged in this process because most of these patients we're going to want to transition to home or to hospice, and often in that environment they're going to be managed by the GP. 
Um, our intensivists are important because they'll help guide us as to where we um, should be and shouldn't be in intervening and also assist with the uh, post-operative care of some of those more difficult cases. Um, our surgeons need to be on board and engaged, and I agree with Graham that it's uh, unfortunate that we don't have more surgeons here today. Um, obviously, oncologists and radiation oncologists are important because chemotherapy and radiotherapy are part of the mainstay of cancer pain management. Our nursing staff need to be educated um, and, and brought up to speed with the way in which we want to manage these patients, and there are ancillary staff that are important as well, such as pastoral care, psychologists and so forth. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, do we have some questions, please? There are two roving mics, so put your hand up and wait for the microphone. We, um, I pioneered the use of uh, intrathecal pumps for pain, and we discovered very early that you don't put an implanted pump in in the final stages of, of malignant pain because you just can't access the thing easily enough to ramp up the doses you need it. So I absolutely agree that somebody who's in the final stages of, of pain relief in palliative care, you, you need an external pump. I can make a comment on that. Yeah, please do, yeah. Um, so that, that's an interesting point to raise, is uh, what is the role of intrathecal um, pain management in the cancer model? Uh, the um, economic modelling alone would suggest that if you have a patient who's appropriate for um, intrathecal pain management, if they have a life expectancy in excess of six months, then they're probably going to break the barrier of cost effectiveness. So um, once you reach that six month mark, the um, $25,000 to $30,000 cost of the, um, of the pump itself and the implantation process is met because of reduced hospital uh, admissions uh, and the care required. So it's actually quite a short period of time. For those patients who, who aren't likely to live that length of time, then there are a couple of options available and we're looking at um, uh, developing some, a, a, perhaps a statewide approach to those patients. And it would include uh, the model that I talked about, just a simple externalised system, or even an internalised, a partially internalised system where there's an intraspinal catheter attached to a subcutaneous port, and that can be run by an external pump. And that's quite uh, acceptable to many patients, and those systems have been run for 18, 24 months uh, quite successfully successfully, um, and uh, they can have a CAD pump that they was, or something similar they can carry around in a bag and have effectively 24-7 uh, uh, intrathecal analgesia as an outpatient. 